So in this video we're going to look at foreign policy under Elizabeth I and it's quite a big one so we're going to go through it bit by bit and we're going to start with the sort of marriage and succession part of her foreign policy because like I said in an earlier video uh, Elizabeth's reign can be really divided into three main policies. So I'm going to do this I'm going to do this first before we look at foreign policy. So we have a look at Elizabeth I'll just go up a little bit so I can, there we go, Elizabeth the first, Elizabeth the first, and we can divide it into religion, and we can divide it into foreign policy, and we can divide it into succession. Okay, these were her main targets as a monarch, and within that, the religion sort of uh, had a direct effect on society uh, the foreign policy had a direct effect on the economy and the succession had a direct effect on the well the dynasty the and there were obviously uh, intertwining uh, areas here these two you could sort of mix them together but mainly the the economy was sort of um, a, a good foreign policy led to a, a good economy. So there's sort of a trend between uh, good foreign policies and good economies. And as religion, if you have an acceptable religious uh, stance, then that leads to um, uh, less social discontent. Okay, so we are going to look at the relation here between the succession and foreign policy. Oh, the succession and foreign policy. This has become a regular feature now, rotating the screen. So religion and, sorry, the foreign policy and the succession. And it was really influenced by the fact that Elizabeth was expected to marry. She was a woman and the sort of purpose of women within society in sort of the um, pre-Reformation, beginning Reformation, uh, renaissance england that sort of area was to marry and to uh, produce children so her ministers believed that marriage was important to the survival of the dynasty and technically they were they were right uh, in the uh, long run so this was technically correct so this was technically correct Because following the death of Elizabeth, we find the end of the Tudor, uh, the Tudor dynasty, and into the Stuarts, and so, as you can imagine, this was correct. However, she refused to bow down to the pressure from her ministers. She wants to make this decision herself, and she made it also clear that she would not follow the steps of her sister, because, as you remember, she fell in love with Philip of Spain. So uh, Mary fell in love, in love with Philip of Spain, and this led to Mary making poor decisions with regard to foreign policy. So she, she was determined not to make that same mistake. And there were a number of problems with the idea of Elizabeth marrying a European prince. The main problem was the fact that it would drag England into a European power struggle. So, this is something that Elizabeth didn't want to do. Elizabeth didn't want to have any major conflicts or wars with any other foreign powers, because she realised, just like her grandfather, uh, Henry the Seventh, she realised just that this was expensive. However, there was also problems with her marrying a member of the English nobility because that would lead to a rivalry among the English nobility and the idea that this particular noble would have more power than every other noble within the English nobility. So Elizabeth was really met with a number of options and she was really left with um, just a number of um, issues here. It was real a dichotomy. It was a real catch twenty two almost between here. She could either marry a European uh, prince and have a power struggle, something she didn't want, or she could marry a member of the English nobility and have a a rivalry and a struggle within England, which is something she also didn't want. So this is probably why 
one of the reasons why she never married. Okay, she never married. She never married. Now let's move on to her foreign policy, and again, we have a number of issues regarding the marriage. So, she used the marriage as a tool in her foreign policy. She could gain favour with uh, different princes and members of the monarchy of different uh, countries in Europe, and that could sort of lead her to uh, try and get what she wants. So, there were a number of princes. For one, Philip of Spain, who was Mary's uh, ex husband there was eric of sweden and then there was francis who was the king uh, sorry the brother of the king of france and really elizabeth wasn't inclined to marry any of them she didn't really care about any of them uh, she used them as a tool to get what she wanted she sort of balanced each contender and it really became useful when she passed childbearing age in around the 1570s okay so by the 1570s we see uh, relations with philip of spain breaking down and he had been convinced by the pope to wage war against england because bear in mind during the when philip of spain was married to mary england was very catholic so under mary under Mary, England was Catholic, and Philip uh, and Spain was Catholic, and Spain was very close to Rome in the in the sort of hierarchy. And the idea of Mary's sister coming to the throne and taking away this radically Catholic um, principle led Philip to declare war against England it was almost seen as a holy war against England against these Protestants these Protestant heretics and to really reintroduce Catholicism back into England okay we can also another important aspect of um, Elizabeth's reign was the relation with Mary Queen of Scots so the fact that um, she had no marriage partner did have its strengths however it did leave her relatively vulnerable and in 1562 she caught smallpox and at this time in her life the idea of her having smallpox um, even in this period of history there wasn't it wasn't a, a disease that was uh, openly curable and 1562 she was of relative uh, relative she wasn't older or anything but she was um in terms of the uh, life expectancy uh, of back then she was it was it was seen that she could possibly die is effectively what i'm trying to get at here she uh, it became a real problem the succession the succession became a real issue when she caught smallpox because at any day she could have died and left the uh, crown uh, with any without anybody to take up the uh, take up the throne her natural successor was mary queen of scots okay however we have another issue here with mary queen of scots mary queen of scots was a catholic so this would have really if this happened and mary queen of scots became uh, the the queen of england she would have reverted the religious settlement, brought Catholicism back, and the mid-Tudor crisis would have continued, and Elizabeth would have not have dealt with the mid-Tudor crisis in any way, because her death just brought everything back again. Okay? So, Mary Queen of Scots had been a captive, a captive since 1568, meant that plotters... Uh, could use her to cause rebellion the fact that she had been captured okay and then in 1587 she was executed when she was involved in something called the babington plot okay this led uh, elizabeth to execute her because elizabeth uh, did survive the smallpox she did get better so this idea here this whole uh, succession of mary queen of scots 
uh, didn't really wouldn't was not a problem okay but during the time it was a big issue okay and the execution of Mary Queen of Scots who was also a Catholic along with the fact that Catholicism had uh, been taken away in and replaced by this religious settlement in England both of these things together led Philip of Spain to launch the Spanish Armada against England and this was in 1588 so we get full-blown war the Spanish Armada against England so really the Spanish Armada was seen as the biggest threat to Elizabeth at the time the Spanish Armada was notorious for its strength and for its uh, durability and for the fact that they would have come in and they would have invaded England and it was almost it was renowned for its strength however it did fail due to a number I'm wondering if I've written it down here uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yes so we'll get to it in a little minute <laughs> so the failure of the Armada we just we do know that the Spanish Armada did fail we'll talk about why it failed in a minute it really led to the end of this Mary Queen of Scots um, issue, okay? Because the Spanish Armada was almost seen as a revolt against Mary Queen of Scots' execution, the unjust execution of Mary Queen of Scots, and the holy war against these Protestant heretics. Almost, that's what that's how it was seen in Spain and also in England. And so, uh, Mary would remain. So Elizabeth. This is a very poorly made uh, template here. So Elizabeth would remain unmarried for the rest of her reign, remaining the Virgin Queen, okay? So fundamentally, fundamentally, her um, sort of marriage uh, issues, her succession issues, could be seen as more of a positive than a negative. So the fact that it was negative because it left her relatively vulnerable. However, the positive was the fact that she could almost taper her foreign policy accordingly and gain favour with different um, uh, European uh, monarchs to, in the sort of hope that they, she would marry them, for example. Okay. Finally, we're going to have a look at foreign policy during the end of her reign, so 1580 to 1603. And this was dominated by Spain. The Spanish Armada was in 1588, okay? And relations with Spain were... They started with tensions and led to the Anglo-Spanish War. So in 15... Uh, in 1585, there were initial tensions that turned into an outright conflict beginning of the Anglo-Spanish War. The Anglo-Spanish War ended in 1604 officially ended in 1604 so after the death of Elizabeth so after the death of Elizabeth however however the main um, blow to Spanish to the Spanish during the Anglo-Spanish War was the uh, disaster of the Armada Okay, so we'll talk about that, then we'll talk about um, the disaster that Elizabeth uh, uh, faced as well. So the, the disaster of the Armada. Philip sent the Armada to invade England in 1588. And really, it was there were poor tactics, and there was good luck in terms of good weather that caused this plan to fail. So it was purely due to poor weather uh, and um, good luck from uh, on the English side that led to the fail of the Armada okay it was still revered as a massive success on Elizabeth's part however in reality it was really uh, very lucky that the Armada failed in the way that it did however there was also the case of Elizabeth sending troops to the Netherlands to help support Dutch Protestants so this is almost like a proxy war where she would try and prop up these protestant nations okay and this proved to be a disaster this didn't work in the slightest okay so we have issues with elizabeth's foreign policy and then we have issues with philip's foreign policy fundamentally the anglo-spanish war had no real winners so 
Anglo-Spanish Spanish War. So there was no real winners. And both uh, made um, grave mistakes. So both Elizabeth, who I'm going to represent as E, and Philip, who I'm going to represent as P, uh, made grave mistakes. However, all together, as a, a look back on Elizabeth's foreign policy, we see that her foreign policy was relatively peaceful. Okay, The only real problems were between Spain, were with Spain, okay? And this was only in the later, um, the later reign of Elizabeth. So from about 1580 onwards was when Spanish, um, was when Spanish tensions began to really accumulate and become a war. So overall, you should really look at uh, Elizabeth's foreign policy in a positive light. The Spanish Armada failed. There was no real winners in the Anglo-Spanish War. Um, for the majority of Elizabeth's reign, it was uh, peace. There was peace. Uh, Elizabeth was a very good diplomat in that she was able to sort of coordinate her uh, the idea of the marriage and the succession to get what she wanted on the European platform. And as a result, her foreign policy can be sort of viewed in a very positive light.